looking out in the Grand Canyon um, is really, you know, soul satisfying when you when you see that and you don't see any power lines and you don't see any sign of human habitation. There's something really special about that. Welcome to Experiences You Should Have, your how-to guide for amazing experiences. And today we're going to be talking about a true adventure here in the U.S. of A. We are talking about rafting the Grand Canyon. Now, we recently did an episode about visiting the Grand Canyon and using uh, the nice bus system to go check out all the stops. But this episode is definitely getting into some adventure. And I am here in Bend, Oregon with a Grand Canyon rafting guide, Andrew Dykus, uh, who will be sharing his experience or the experience of rafting the Grand Canyon. Welcome to the show, Andy. Thanks. It's good to be here, Gail. Appreciate it. Here we are. We are going to be diving in, or I guess maybe floating on, (laughs) (laughs) floating on this experience. So uh, describe the experience of rafting the Grand Canyon to our listeners. Well, I think that everybody should do it if they can once in their life, at least. Mm -hmm. Um, It's an experience unlike any other, and I feel like um, if you could create a river rafting trip on your own, had all the pieces there to do it yourself, it'd be hard to do any better than it already is. Um, And most people I've, um, most trips I've done, I've had almost every trip I've had a guest say they saw it from the rim and wanted to do the river trip. Mm -hmm. But then when they get down there and actually do it, it just surpasses everybody's expectations. And I think there's nothing like being on the boat and seeing the scenery come to you mm-hmm. and scroll to you as you roll down. And particularly with the Grand Canyon, unlike other places, it just kind of blows your expectations away in an increasing level every single moment and every day. So, for example, once you start, you're at the level of the rim of the stone that is the rim that you stand on when you're looking over the south rim and that level rises as you slice into it basically and it rises about a thousand feet for every 10 miles until you know it's towering five and six thousand feet above you okay and so every day you're kind of cutting deeper and deeper into this the walls rise above you and your expectations are just blown away every time Oh every every moment. So what so. types of colors are you seeing? The colors are really, really run the gamut. Um, especially when you have the evening or the morning light. But there is a layer, for example, um, there's a layer called the Moen Uh There's different layers that were, you know, deposits from inland oceans, for example, which would be the red wall limestone layer. And then there's shales and things like the Moenkopi shale. Um, and that has all kinds of colors that you wouldn't believe. It has greens and oranges and purples, all from trace minerals that are in that shale. And so when the light catches on that Moenkopi layer, it's just quite incredible. Wow. But in general, you know, it's your, it's your um, tan and, and reddish hues uh-huh. for the uh-huh. most part. Now, how many times have you rafted the Grand Canyon? That's a good question, and I don't honestly know the answer. <laughs> um, I I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of upper 30s. Okay, okay. So what is an experience that really stands out in your mind when you have rafted the Grand Canyon? That's a tough one because there's so many, but there is something that's truly special if you are lucky enough to see it in the Grand Canyon. Mm-hmm. And you have to suffer a little bit to see it. Um, If you do a trip during the summer monsoons, which is late July, early August, where the Gulf of California monsoons come up to the canyon, you'll oftentimes be cold and wet for a while. And the water coming out of uh, the dam, the Glen Canyon Dam, is pulled out from several hundred feet below. So it's very cold water 
in the 40s um, wow. or the 50s uh, at the most at the bottom. So you're, if it's raining on you, it can be quite cold in the middle of July out there. But if that happens and you get caught in a truly spectacular storm where the rain's really coming, coming on strong, these waterfalls sprout all over the canyon. And you can see them, the trained eye can see where they sprout during dry spells because you can see the, the rock is smoothed away. But it's absolutely spectacular because these waterfalls are huge. You know, some of them are um, as big as Multnomah Falls. Wow. And, and as far as thickness, but you can see them starting at the top of the canyon and then maybe they will disappear for a little while as they pool up in one layer and then they'll spill over and come down. And some of them are the color of tomato juice and they smell like the earth and like sagebrush. And, and some of them are clear and some of them are chocolate milk color, but you can sweep your head and maybe see 20 waterfalls happening all at once. And so if you're lucky enough to see that, it's worth every moment of being cold to see that. And I've seen it, you know, a handful of times. Wow. Okay. So if you wanted to see that, you mentioned late July, early August to shoot for a trip? Yep. Late July, early August is when the monsoons happen. So that is a good time to do that if you want to do that. You'd have to be prepared to be very, very hot uh-huh. and very, very cold because you could have all kinds of weather during that time period. Okay. So let's say we're about to embark on a trip down the Grand Canyon. What does each day look like? So that question depends on if you're traveling via motor, of which um, there are many companies who do motor guided trips, or human power. Um, Obviously, I think the most pure experience is to go um, human powered. Okay. Especially if you can with a dory company, because then you're in, you know, a traditional um, wooden dory. Okay. Actually designed um, from the Mackenzie River boats in Oregon Mm -hmm. that were taken down to the Grand Canyon. Um, And then you get the real silent hiss of the water and and you can hear the canyon wren and you're kind of more in tune with with the uh, moment to moment. But I work for a motor company. Okay. Um, I've done several trips non-motorized but for the majority of people they can't take 16 to 30 days of their life and go down and do the grand canyon so the motorized trip offers them the opportunity to do it in a shorter period of time six days for example okay what does a motorized trip look like so a motorized trip um there are several different boat types used down in the grand canyon Mm -hmm. and they're all um quite large they hold 15 to 18 passengers plus two guides, okay. one of whom is the main guide. And then there's somebody known as the swamper, which does the bow line, pulls the tables off uh, during lunch and um, sets up the toilet during <laughs> <laughs> during camp and breaks all that down, um, but is another, another guide. Um, and these boats are huge. Uh, you know, the J rigs and the S rigs are the two different types and the J rigs, are 38 feet long and 18 feet wide and several tons. And um, there's multiple places to sit on them. There's kind of safer and less wet places, um, which is in quotations because anything can happen out there. Uh Um, And then there's places where you can sit right up front and kind of um, get smashed by the waves head first, you know. Um, So the motorized trips are nice because they're a little bit more – communal and they're kind of like a, a giant barge where you're all um, communicating with each other but you can cover the mileage a lot more uh, quickly in between the hikes and the rapids so it can afford you to do 30 miles a day and you know you have to do um, a minimum if you don't hike out at phantom ranch of uh, 187 miles or so so it's a lot to Actually, if you're going to take out and do your own trip, you're going to have to go 226 miles. So the motor rigs are good because they offer uh, the opportunity to do it for people who don't have that kind of time to do the full trip. Mm -hmm. But either way, the canyon is – the day-to-day experience there is radically different from Mm day-to-day. And I think that's what's so special about it in a way. Um. One might think that it's just similar rock and it's going to look the same every day, but every day is completely different. 
Uh, and once you get to, for example, the inner granite gorge or the upper granite gorge, you're in a layer of, of uh, Vishnu schist, this very old rock. Um, it kind of makes up a lot of the Rockies and is a basement layer in a lot of the earth. But it's uh, schist and, and pegmatite granite, and it's you know several. It's almost two billion years old. Wow. And so you cut down into this, and it's very hard, and it, it kind of encloses on the canyon, and it, this is where all the rapids get really big and really serious, and it's kind of darker in there, and okay. there's these beautiful convolutions. And it's totally different from some other areas where it's wide open and you know um, more expansive views of the traditional Grand Canyon that we think of when we look at pictures from the rim. Right, right. So you're so each day you're on the water. About how many hours a day are you on the water? So some days are better for hiking, and so you may be on the water for a shorter period of time. Um, and some days are more rapid days um, where you're just hitting rapid after rapid, like the upper granite gorge that I told you about is one of those days. Um, in a in a a motor rig trip, you're on the uh, on the river for probably three to four hours a day, um, but it's broken up by, you know, you you get up and you have your breakfast and and then you motor for maybe an hour and then you stop and do a hike, um, and then you motor and then you have lunch and and then you so on and so forth. It's probably fairly similar on a on a rowing trip. I think it's probably. You know, most people spend about three to four hours um, on the raft. And then part of the benefit, though, is the side hikes are kind of the best kept secret of the Grand Canyon. And so the side hikes are a worthy diversion from being on the boats. Okay. Now, these side hikes that you're going on, can you only access them from being on the river or would you be able to access these side hikes from the rim? That's a great question. One of the Havasu Falls, you can certainly access from the rim, from the Havasupai Indian Reservation. And that's one that's every single person who rafts the canyon will absolutely do from the the Colorado River up. Okay. It's a must stop. Great. Um, And we did an episode on um, Havasu Falls, so definitely go back and check it out. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's a great one. Um, there are a bunch of them that you can actually access from the rim. Um, and there's a lot of really great trails from the rim that come down. Um, and then yet there are also quite a few that are really only accessible from the river. And, um, some of them are, um, just stunning beyond description. And a lot of the thing about the Canyon is that anytime you add water, to one of these side canyons in the form of a spring or a creek, the biodiversity flourishes. So you have this this incredible green, beautiful little oasis that may think you make you think that you're in Hawaii, you know. And then there's hummingbirds and there's little you know monkey flowers and all kinds of you know different insect life. And suddenly this all springs to life in these little canyons. And there's a lot of of, of springs and uh, side creeks that create these little oases. And so they're kind of hard to believe until you get into there and see them. Fun. Now, what's your favorite hike that you can only do if you're rafting the Grand Canyon? That would probably be Matt Catamiba. And that's probably most, there's probably a lot of guys who find that to be one of their favorites. Um, And the reason for that is it's just a classic slot canyon and it's cut through a layer of limestone that's particularly silvery and beautiful and striated, very uniform-like. And so it's this silvery, kind of sinuous, beautiful slot canyon that you have to pull the boats into and then kind of do a wet hike up through. And then you get to a giant amphitheater at the end of that. And it's just kind of a magical spot. Oh, wow. That sounds incredible. We'll make sure to link to that on the show notes on experiences you should have. So definitely check out the site for more information and that sort of thing. Um, so if you're on a motorboat, you're you're spending a few hours a day on some on the water. You're doing some hikes. Uh, what about when when evening falls? What's that like? A lot of fun. <laughs> it's really nice. 
um, you usually, in fact, I really like to get to camp early enough that people have some time to really relax and explore and even just, you know, sit and talk and look around at the, uh, the canyon. But yeah, we usually hit camp um, maybe in the neighborhood of 4.35, 30, depending on if you're at a campsite that actually has a hike at it. You may get there earlier so that people can have time to explore the hike. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the beaches are sandy. Um, there's a couple of rock shelf camps, but there's a lot of really nice sandy beaches. And there's a lot of different variety in the places you can camp there, but there are some truly spectacular campsites in the canyon. Um, I mean, just the worst campsite in the canyon is one of my is is one of the best campsites you can imagine, you know, just because of the scenery. Yeah. Um, so we usually, you know, st- stop there and then send people off to find their own little spot. Um, most companies provide cots for the guests so that they're up above the sand, which can be um, helpful for reducing the heat or keeping them cool, you know, just uh-huh. having the, the wind. Um, we provide tents if they if they want them, but usually they're just overly hot unless you're in the monsoon season like we talked about. Okay. So we kind of get them set up on that and get them off um, setting up that. And then we set up this – most companies set up a really nice elaborate kitchen and you have, you know, a blaster for, you know, boiling water and everything and getting coffee ready. And then you have a full – basically a full functional kitchen. And we set up – some nice toilets for people. Usually there's a toilet with um, an outdoor view and it's usually like, you know, an incredible view, like one of the best places to use the toilet. Uh, so when you mean set up a toilet, what does this toilet uh, look like per se? So it, it's an aluminum box, welded box or steel welded box um, that uh, is probably about two feet by two and a half feet. And a couple feet high, about as high as your regular toilet, and it just has a toilet seat on it. And um, and then so you usually have some sort of ticket system, like maybe um, like a, a paddle or a raft or um, to indicate that it's in use. Okay. And you have a hand wash station set up right there. Somebody goes by, grabs that paddle at the hand wash station and walks down a little trail to a really beautiful view and then uses the uh, the toilet okay there. okay because you're required in the Grand Canyon to carry everything out uh-huh. all your trash and all your waste um, so can you smell the waste when you're on the boat like how is that handled no you can't um, it's sealed very tightly and then just packed down in the load below um, kind of um, below where the the kind of motors area is and where a bunch of the uh, the gear is stowed and there's these pig you know people have different methods of storing them but in general you know they're sealed really well and no you don't you don't smell it okay. now what if people want to shower that's tough they can bring their um they can bring their own uh, solar showers you know if they want to do that yeah um but in general um you can bathe uh using uh soap in the main channel of the river uh-huh and um That's about it. Or you can kind of put your head underneath one of the side channel waterfalls and and get a a nice shower that way. Oh, wow. But there are no soaps allowed in those side channels. Okay. And that's uh, to protect the native endemic fish species that breed in those those native creeks that flow into the main Colorado. Okay. Got it. I mean, this is a very earthy, natural experience where... You are showering and bathing in the Grand Canyon, and you're using the toilet overlooking the Grand Canyon. That's right. Yeah, that sounds pretty amazing. <laughs> it is good, and I think, I think, it may cause some trepidation in people, and those are the things that they're usually most worried about when they do the trip: is how am I going to shower and how am I going to use the bathroom? Yeah. Um, but then I think somewhere around day two or three kind of the uh, the shackles of society seem to kind of slip away from you just because of the strange music that is moving through the Grand Canyon. And it just, it kind of, um, you find your yourself like relaxing in a way that I don't, I don't think is necessarily possible in our uh, fast-paced society um, to the degree that you do there, you know, when you have 
no power lines over you and and nothing but the sound of the water um, it really does uh, bring this sense of peace and I think that then pretty much overrides anybody's trepidation about you know using the bathroom or um, you know lack of cleanliness you can certainly shower it's just it's really cold water and that's what a lot of people don't realize historically it would have been warm when you, you got to the summer before the dam but when the dam was built in 63 and finally full in 1980 all the water that comes down through the Grand Canyon is pulled from several hundred feet down below the surface of the lake Lake uh-huh. Powell so it's cold it comes out at about 43 degrees Ooh. very cold so a shower usually at the top of the canyon consists of jumping in the water jumping back out soaping up jumping in the water jumping back out yeah got that's it, it. Okay. <laughs> but it's worth it. Okay. That's, that's great. That's great. Now, what about for people that are on like a longer trip, maybe not on electric or like a, a motorboat, if they're on that traditional dory, um, are they able to jump in and jump out along that longer trip to soap up and, and shower? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um yeah, I mean, everybody can just bathe right right there in the in the main channel of the Colorado. It's just that if you're, including if you're on a dory trip or a raft trip, but anybody who's, if I think the, re, the regulation is within 100 feet upstream or downstream of a side channel river. Okay. Is where you're not allowed to use soap, which is, that can be um, a challenge for some people because they that's where they most want to use the soap because the side channels are often quite a bit warmer, the water. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so it feels kind of like a bath or a shower when you're standing under that waterfall. Um, but it's it's not allowed. But, you know, you can scour yourself clean with, you know, the, yeah. the water. Right, right. Now, how has the Grand Canyon changed you or changed your thinking? That's a great question. Um, I think very fundamentally, you know, I came to it as a young young man. And, um, I think it's shaped who I am in very fundamental ways. Um, you know, I always believed that we need spaces without development on them to uh, satiate some part of our soul, you know? And so Mm -hmm. looking out in the Grand Canyon, um, is really, you know, soul satisfying when you when you see that and you don't see any power lines and you don't see any sign of human habitation there's something really special about that and um and so i think it's given me a huge appreciation for the particular history of our country and how so many people fought so hard to preserve those for the public trust the national parks idea um you know It almost didn't happen in a lot of places, including the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. Um, And you could imagine uh, there was a lot of people who would want to own places like the Grand Canyon. So it's given me a lot of appreciation for um, just how amazing that is. And in fact, I mean, we had the first national park in the world, you know, Mm -hmm. um, in Yellowstone. So but I think it's also I think it shapes everybody who's down there. one of the common traits I've I've noticed amongst all the boat men and women who I've known is that they can apply so many different skills to other areas in their life that you could ascribe to the canyon, to what it taught you, and to being a guide down there. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Let's get into some uh, logistics here. Um, first off, where do you start and where do you end up? Oh, yeah. Great question. So everybody starts at the same place. Um, well, let me just say, if you're going to put in on the water, everybody's going to start at Lee's Ferry. And Lee's Ferry is 15 miles or so downstream from the Glen Canyon Dam. And when you put in there... Um, that's where you'll start if you're going to do the whole canyon or the upper canyon portion. And then, really, the first place to take the boats out 
is 226 miles downstream at a place called Diamond Creek, which is on the Hualapai Indian Reservation. So you can go through Peach Springs on the Hualapai Indian Reservation and take out there at mile 226, or you can go down another 30 miles or so um, in the 250 mile range, and, and then you're in the, the headwaters of Lake Mead. And then you can take out several spots at Lake Mead. So you can do that whole trip, or there is one or two, there's two possibilities for exchanging and doing part of the trip. So you could um, opt to hike in at Phantom Ranch or um, any, at, at a couple of different trails that take you down to Phantom Ranch and do an exchange there. Mm-hmm. Or you can take mules down there. Um, and I've done that one time on a private trip where I hiked in and met them at Phantom Ranch and then joined them for the second half of the trip. Mm-hmm. Um, but commercial companies do that all the time as well. So I think private companies do it a lot. People who can only afford to do half of the trip in terms of time or uh, commitments will hike in or out at Phantom Ranch. And that's about 88 miles or 89 miles downstream from Lee's Ferry. Okay. So if you're rafting, you could do that non-motorized in maybe six or seven days to get down there. And if you're on a commercial trip uh, with a motor rig, you're probably doing that in about three days or four days to get down there. The other option, and the only place that a helicopter is allowed in the canyon, is mile 187, which is called Whitmore Wash. And so you can do a helicopter exchange, too. And some of the commercial companies um, do a helicopter exchange. Oh, wow. So the company that I work for, for example, you can do an upper six-day trip. And then uh, at mile 187, the helicopters come in and shuttle all those people out and bring in... Uh, you know, a whole new crew, and then they do a lower or three-day trip. Now, what company do you work for? Western River Expeditions is the name of the one I work for. Okay, great. Been working for them for 22 years. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah, they're a great company. They've been really good to me, and they're kind of like family. Yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I bet. And, okay, so you can come in many different ways via hike, helicopter, um, hike helicopter, or can you just show, show up? Yeah, you can just show up. Um, you know, so if you're going to do the, uh, the upper Canyon or the whole Canyon, you're going to start at the same place at Lee's Ferry. And that's, um, about maybe, um, an hour or so from Jacob Lake, which is the jumping off point for the north rim of the canyon. Okay. And maybe three hours or so from Flagstaff coming from the south. Um, And so um, Lee's Ferry is actually worth a visit, even if you're not um, running the canyon. It's an incredibly beautiful place. Um, And it's surrounded by a, a series of cliffs called the Vermilion Cliffs, which are in their own right spectacular. And so you can just show up and start there. And that's where you would start the the canyon trip if you um, opted to do the upper canyon. Okay. Do you prefer just doing the upper canyon or doing the entire thing? So that's a great question. I would highly recommend if people are going to go with a company who does the exchange at the helicopter pad, um, Whitmore Wash, I would highly recommend doing the upper if you're going to do that. Okay. Um, the lower is great if you don't have as much time and you want to just do three days and get a quick look in the canyon. It's got a, a fantastic place called Travertine Canyon, which is a, an amazing little waterfall grotto. But that's one of the few waterfall hikes that it has, whereas the upper has um, countless slot canyons and waterfall hikes and the majority of the big classic rapids and um some of the most dramatic things almost all of them in my mind are in that upper 187 miles now what class size of rapids are there in the grand canyon that's another great great question gail um they are pretty much class threes and fours with the occasional class five this is the the typical class system but in the grand canyon they've They've adopted a um, 10-point system, which essentially just doubles that 
scale that most um, of the rest of the rivers of the world and of the country are graded on, mm -hmm. um, which is to say class three is um, kind of busy rapids with several moves you have to make. Um, and class five is, is um, uh, much more complicated with some kind of critical moves you have to make and higher consequence. Okay. So those are called the class tens in, in uh, the Grand Canyon. And those are some of the more famous rapids uh, in the nation, like Crystal Rapid and uh, Lava Falls Rapid. Okay, okay. Now, can you raft the Grand Canyon year-round? You can. In fact, a lot of private companies, or sorry, private uh, trips um, are done in the winter because you have a greater allotment of days. So I think you can get... I think you can take up to 30 days or more on a trip, on a private trip in December, whereas you can only take, I think, 16 during the high season from spring to fall. Um, and so a lot of people who are there uh, just to do the hikes will go in the wintertime when it's cooler. It can actually snow. It can be snowy, but um, they'll do it because then they can do hikes that you would normally um, be too exposed to do in the heat of the summer. Mm-hmm. The private, um, sorry, the public uh, commercial river trips um, are, are only allowed to operate from, uh, I think, September to, or sorry, uh, from uh, March to September. March through September. I believe so. So if you were going to pick your three favorite months to raft the Grand Canyon, what would they be? Well... I do love uh, J late July and August. It's funny because that can be a tough time for a boatman who's doing a whole season. Yeah. You can get kind of salty that time of year because uh -huh. it's been hot, hot, hot. Um, and then it starts raining on you. And it's um, so oftentimes that's what I get to do as a, a boatman who just does one or one trip a year is I get to come in and, and fill in for somebody who's taking a break. Yeah. Um, I love that time of year, though. Um, it can be really hot, but you can get that special monsoon. Um, this last trip that I did, there was just spectacular evening skies and sunsets and double rainbows, and we had some of those uh, waterfalls that, that I talked about. Did you just say double rainbow? I said double rainbows, yeah. You said double rainbow. <laughs> you like double rainbows? I love double rainbows, and I love the video of the guy of doing double rainbow. Oh, I don't know that one. You don't know Double Rainbow? I need to watch that, huh? <gasps> I'm going to send you the Double Rainbow video. So you know that Double Rainbow is the second rainbow is an inversion of the color scheme? You know, I didn't know that. We were talking about this on this last trip. I didn't even, uh, I didn't know why, um, but it's really interesting. It's the, um, so it's instead of re, you Roy, know, Roy Jibiv, Jibiv, it's it's the reverse. Wow. And so everybody was talking about it on the trip, and none of us really knew. We had a lot of theories. But really, instead of a refraction, it's a reflection uh. off the surface of the water droplets that causes the double, which oh, is wow. why it's a mirror image. Crazy. But we had, we, we had like six, six nights where we had double rainbows. It was incredible. Okay, I'm going to send you a double rainbow video. You're, okay. you're going to love this. You're going to love it. I'll give you a picture of one of them for your uh, website. Okay, great. Okay, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. So back to your question, though, I also think September is an amazing time of year to do it. Um, it cools off a little bit, maybe into the 70s or 80s. Mm -hmm. So it's still, um, it's still not quite as cold as doing a December trip when you have snow potentially, and it can be you basically need a dry suit. Um, September is a spectacular time to do it, absolutely. And there are cottonwood trees in some of these side canyons. And so those will be changing yellow, you know, and um, it's, it's just a beautiful time of year to do it. And then the springtime, um, March, April, May, they're all great times to do it. You can get a little chilly because you can get all kinds of weather, especially in March. I've had it snow on us in March. But you get these desert blooms that are incredible. Mm -hmm. um, there's a brittle brush plant that blooms and just covers huge sections of the canyon for for miles and up several thousand feet. And then you get all this um, different, beautiful wildflowers blooming everywhere. And it can be amazing. One of the things that's really special, if you can catch it, is some of the side canyons have red bud trees. Do you know what those are? Mm -mm, I don't. They're an ornamental tree that's, um, that's planted a lot, you know, just in cities and stuff for its beauty. And they have these little heart-shaped green leaves and these 
purplish flowers that are just spectacular. Mm. And so there's there's several canyons, side canyons in the Grand Canyon that are filled with these, or maybe there's just a single one or two of them. But if they're blooming purple, and then you have this, you know, creek running through that that might be crystal blue, and then you have these greenery around it, and then these red walls rising up to the sky, it's just kind of hard to describe. It's absolutely surreal when you see that. And so that's worth going for the springtime trips there, too. Okay. All right. That's that's really good to know. Now, if if you're going to do a motorized trip, do you need to enter the lottery? Or how does this whole lottery system work for a permit? Oh, that's a great question. So, no, you don't. If you're going to do a commercial trip, you don't need to enter the lottery at all. There's a certain amount of commercial permits that are allotted for the 13 or so companies that run down in the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And so those are already, um, they have a certain amount of user days already, as they're called. So you can just sign up for one of those. It's an increasingly popular thing now and bookings uh, certainly for the company I work for, Western River Expeditions, but I think all across the board are really um, at their peak now. Um, yeah. you know, it's a popular thing to do. So you might want to get maybe even up to a year in advance All right. or six months in advance minimally to get on to a commercial trip. But you don't need to enter a lottery to do so. You need to enter a lottery if you want to do a private trip. And the private trip, um, it's pretty easy to enter the lottery. It's a lot easier than it used to be because uh-huh. it used to be kind of famously, um, uh, eternity to 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 get on this list i mean you you would get on a list and there was such a long list of people that it would take you 10 12 15 20 years to actually get that permit wow which was ridiculous you know because you you don't want to plan to go see it when you're 60 and start planning when you're 40 right so they revamped that and i think that was about 2000 or no sorry yeah maybe it was about 2001 or two but anyway, they revamped it and made it more like a weighted lottery, like is such as is used for hunting permits and things. Mm-hmm. So now you have a chance. You could just join the lottery right now and pull a permit, you know, for, um, you know, next year. Or as soon as they open the permits for next year, you, you have uh, as good a chance as anybody. In fact, you have a better chance than I do because I've already done a private trip. And so you would have a five times greater chance than than somebody who's done a private trip. Okay, so let's say I pulled a permit. I, I won the lottery. Congratulations. Thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, I don't know how to raft. You know, I've, I've been rafting before, but I don't know how to guide. What do I do next? So if you're going to go that route and do a private trip, yeah, you kind of have to maybe think about starting the conversation beforehand and finding your friends who have done them um, have some river experience because you'll need somebody um, who's either done the Grand Canyon before or has comparable river experience. And there's kind of a list, I think, that the National Park uses and considers comparable. And that would be like the middle fork of the salmon, the main fork of the salmon. I think maybe um, some of the Colorado rivers and maybe um, some of the California rivers count as well. Um, but it really is logistically um, complicated. There's yeah. a lot of logistics to take care of, and the rapids are significant. And, um, you know, you you need somebody who can uh, navigate those safely and, and, uh, and um, you know, knows how to read the rapids and has a lot of experience with reading them and scouting them and then guiding people safely through them. And then, uh, then you'll need, that's the trip. You'll be the trip leader if you draw that permit. So you'll have to have somebody who knows what they're doing. A lot of times it's people who have been rafting for quite a while, but really all you need is somebody uh, you just need one person on the boat who knows what they're doing right. and then you can just right. jump on and join them. Right. You know? Right. So, you know, you just get kind of to know some uh, river people mm-hmm. and you can do that in a number of ways, you know. Sure. Um, and then uh, try to get on uh, with them. Okay. So what a lot of people do is they um, set their sights on something like 
the Grand Canyon or the Middle Fork of the Salmon or something like that. And then once they decide that they want to do that trip and they have the team, um, not all of whom have to be boatmen or boat women, as we discussed, then you kind of all put in for the permit. And so then you just up your odds of getting drawing that permit. Okay, got it. And I think you're going to put the uh, website for uh, applying for the permit on there, but... Yes, which is GCRA, um, GCA, uh, you know what? I can't even read my own handwriting. I'm going to put it on experiencesyoushouldhave.com under episodes, and there will be a link to how you can get a permit. Apologize yeah. to you listeners. Terrible handwriting. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, but on that link, you can sign up. It's a nominal fee, and then they'll just send you um lottery dates as they become available. In fact, that we were just looking at one, Gail and I, that I got an email from them uh, maybe a week ago, and it just closed on the 10th for a spattering of, of dates that are available for November and, and December this year. Um, so if you're interested, you can sign up for that, and, um, and there'll be a link on Gail's website on how to do that. Okay. Now, if you go with um, a company like yours... How much is it going to cost and how long is that trip? That's another great question. Um, and I, I, I wanted to speak to that um, because I think financially it's a pretty big commitment to go with a commercial outfitter. Um, I would say I think the minimum is $1,400 per or person? something per person. And then all the way up to, you know, like... 2800 3000 okay um on the upper end for the motorized uh trips um or even i think even the the rowing trips some of them are more expensive than that if you're doing the entire canyon okay um so if you're doing a 12 day trip in the middle of the summer with one of the dory companies or or one of the um traditional raft human powered raft companies um that may be 12, 13 days. And if you do the entire thing, then, you know, that may be three grand, four grand. Okay. But a lot of times that includes, so for example, with Western, if that includes a flight from Vegas to Marble Canyon, where we shuttle you down to Lee's Ferry, which is about a five mile drive and you put in, and then it, it will include your helicopter ride out at the Whitmore Wash. Oh, wow. It includes a helicopter it ride. It includes a helicopter ride. So, hey. and I've never gotten on that helicopter, although a lot of my fellow guides have taken a taking an up and down on that helicopter ride just to see it. Um, but it looks amazing. I mean, these guys are, are um, the pilots are bananas, and they just kind of point this thing down and just tear down into the canyon and pick up four people and just rip off up to the rim. And uh, so it includes that. And then, um, and then your shuttle back to uh, Vegas if you're staying there or Marble Canyon if you're staying there. Okay. And then it includes, you know, Gourmet, the food is excellent. Um, most companies I've found the food is just incredible. Um, and um, you're, you're really kind of catered to. You have your own little chairs and you have your own cots and you have tents if you need them. The guides cook everything for you. I mean, it's it's really nice. And then they keep you uh, safe going through all the rapids. They take the rattlesnakes out of your camp if the rattlesnakes appear in your camp. Okay, cool. I don't want a rattlesnake <laughs> in my camp. It happens. Have and, you handled a rattlesnake? Oh yeah, we all have. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> in fact, you know when when I started, um, we had to use our own devices to bring the rattlesnakes out of the camp, and it's a national park, and so you don't do any harm to any of the animals there. So there's no killing of the rattlesnakes. But um, you know, so what we used to do is we we our motor handles had to have an extension on it, which was usually a PVC pipe or an aluminum pipe, and we would take that. Uh, pipe it was a cylinder and we could run like a little rope through it with a little loop on the end uh -huh. and use that to loop that rope around the snake's <laughs> neck and kind of gently pull it tight and then like remove the snake or just take a couple of sticks uh, you know a pair of tongs from the kitchen and remove the snake i mean um, are you afraid you're gonna miss and then the snake is gonna bite you and kill you and then your people are gonna be without a guide and yeah that's why you used the motor handle because it was safer <laughs> now it was two and a half three feet away from you when you picked it up but now the guide's it's gotten way more sophisticated. Now they have these these little snake grabbers. Okay. And so it's like three feet away from them. They can just gently grab the snake and then take it and move it out of the camp. 
Um, and then does it remember your face and come on to you and then try to <laughs> eat you in the middle of the night? They're pretty smart. Yeah. Um, some of them are territorial and they will come back. But most of the snakes that you find in the Grand Canyon, um, there are some ill-tempered snakes like the Mojave Green, but you don't see that snake very often. Um, the rattlesnake that you see most commonly is called the pygmy Grand Canyon pink rattlesnake. And it's a pretty docile snake and it just tries to avoid humans in general. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. All right. So we've talked about snakes. We have to get that out of the way. Oh, my gosh. Um, oh, and then I did want to mention, though, if you went the private uh, trip route, uh-huh. um, you know, it takes some networking. You're going to need to find your people and, um, and uh, know somebody who has some experience. But once you do that, it's actually really affordable. So there's companies that, you know, you can bring all your own gear down, but there are companies that will – outfit you just you know 100 percent. so they'll take care of your boats they'll have all your food um it'll be labeled in the dry goods will be labeled in in boxes that say day one which will have your lunch dinner Uh and breakfast in it and then your your trash then just goes right back in that they'll take care of your trash and your refuse at the end of the trip and i think when we did our private trip my recent one it was it ends up being like sixty dollars a day for all of that. Are you kidding me? And so Does that include a boat, like a that raft? includes the boat, the wow. raft, and everything, and the shuttle from Flagstaff. And so a couple of companies that do that. There's Mo and Kopi. There's um, there's Canyon Rio R E O, the acronym R E O. Canyon Rio does it. That's who we went uh, with. But it's incredibly affordable. Sixty bucks a day. All right. So let's say let's say someone pulled a private permit. And let's say they found a guide on the interwebs, and now they're paying $60 a day for their boat and food and that sort of thing. How much should they pay that guide that they find on average? Make sure they're not being, like, gouged or underpaying or overpaying. or. So I think it's illegal, actually, to pay a guide on a private trip oh. to have anybody paid on a private trip. Wow. I'm okay. fairly certain Never that's mind about that. <laughs> illegal. Yeah, Don't you can pay look at the... that guy because you might you get put in jail. Yeah, I, I think it's a national park uh, regulation that, that a private trip is – there are no fees exchanged on a private trip. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh... – so you have to that. find a really good friend who just wants to go and just do it. But the the good news is anybody who's ever been on a raft um, and rafted rapids will almost surely want to jump on your river trip with you. So, you know, I've had um, recently a friend um, pulled a raft uh, permit for the Rogue, and he hasn't done – that trip, nor a ton of rafting since, uh, um, well, any in Oregon. Um, but he was a raft guy at one point, but he was able to just quickly get a bunch of us all on board with that trip. And, um, several of whom had already seen the rogue before, Mm -hmm. but a lot of people will, um, you know, will, will just grab a permit and then ask their river friends if they want to go after they get the permit. The mm-hmm. hard part seems to be getting the permit. Now, let's say you go on like a commercial <clears throat> trip. Um, you're you're paying your fees. Now, I know like if you're on a dive live aboard, you typically tip, you know, like 15% of the trip cost. Are you tipping uh, commercial guides? Yeah. Um, 15% is is like a live aboard dive. Yeah. Dive trip. Is that do they feed you and cook for you and all that stuff, too? Not the guides, but the crew is, and it's kind of split split in between the crew. Yeah. Um, I mean, typically the Grand Canyon guide, like I said, removes the snakes from Mm -hmm. the camp, cooks all the food, carries, uh, sets up your toilets, keeps you safe on all these hikes, uh, administers first aid. There's oftentimes, you know, um, almost all of them, I think, are required to have a wilderness EMT Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. or a a WEMI, which is like just a wilderness medical um, uh, cert. Um, that's a national park requirement. So, and then, you know, they're required to know how to communicate with the national park service and, um, you know, uh, coordinate an evacuation if people get hurt, which has happened to me, you know, 
five or six times oh, wow. having to evacuate somebody via helicopter. So you need to know all the landing zones and all this stuff. And then you're keeping them safe through the rapids and you're teaching them all this stuff. So, you know, the, the guide is, is, um, is, is doing, wearing a lot of different hats. Um, and they do depend on, uh, tips for their, um, you know, for their livelihood. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's, um, you know, entirely up to the customer, but I think the industry standard is, seems to land between 10 and 20%. Okay. Just like you said, you know, I just went with a fishing guide on the Oregon coast, um, and tipped him 20% because once you've been a guide, you know, you can see, you know, how hard these people work and what it's, what it's worth to them. Right. Yeah. So just make sure you factor factor that in to your budgeting to allow for tipping of the guides. I think it's very important. Now, as far as age requirements, I mean, could this be a family fun event where people bring their kids down the Grand Canyon? That's another really good question. A lot of people wait to meet those age requirements in our, with bated breath. Um, for the Upper Canyon, I think... There actually is a 12-year-old minimum okay. for the Upper Canyon. So, um, you know, there are quite a few of my my fellow guides who just can't wait until their kids are 12 so they can show them um, that Upper Canyon, which I said, as I said earlier, I think is the most spectacular mm-hmm. part. Um, but the Lower Canyon is also incredibly beautiful. And for somebody who's never been down to the water in the Grand Canyon, it's still really a mind-blowing thing to see. And it usually just kind of what's their appetite to see the upper, but you can take, I think nine year olds and above, or in some cases, maybe seven year olds and above on the lower three day trip. Okay, cool. So those are the age requirements. Good to know. Now let's say, uh, you have limited mobility or what if you're in a wheelchair? Um, are there companies out there that you could go on to raft the Grand Canyon? There are, that's a really good question. Um, that's it is a a challenge and um you one who has um disabilities or is in a wheelchair or um would would have to choose the company carefully because some companies for example require you to hike down f- to phantom ranch from the r- south rim uh-huh. yeah. or to take mules down and so obviously that would be a company to avoid but um there are several companies who who do so. Um, and, you know, I think there's a company who does a wounded warriors trip with it, which is for veterans um, who've suffered from um, physical injuries and or PTSD. And then, you know, there's, um, there's several different companies, I think. Um, one of them, Wilderness River Adventures, WRA. Um, I can't remember, I think Hatch does it. And then Arizona River Adventures, ARA are all good ones to look at if you're um, curious about um, doing a trip, but say you're in a wheelchair. Um, And there certainly are trips, uh, companies who accommodate people who are in wheelchairs. Um, They oftentimes have a trip uh, specially set aside for um, people with disabilities because the pace is slower and um, they may require some more guide assistance to help people in and out of the boats and things Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. and set up their camps. The company I used to work, I work for, used to do a trip. I, they may still do them um, up in a uh, canyon called Cataract Canyon, mm-hmm. which is also really great whitewater. It's it's the stretch of the Colorado River right before it flows into Lake Powell, so upstream from the Grand Canyon, and is in Utah. And we used to do a trip there where we we had um, people with uh, physical and mental. Um, disabilities and um also um at risk youth and it was an excellent trip and we would take the j rigs these big rigs there and we had several people in wheelchairs and um and it was just a wonderful trip and um so they're they're definitely out there and you shouldn't let uh you shouldn't let um being in a wheelchair dissuade you from wanting to do the grand canyon rafting great thank you thank you for that uh, so let's say you're going to go on this trip. Where are the top things you need to bring on this trip? Most companies will have a pretty exhaustive list, but um, one thing that really can limit a, the enjoyment of a trip is um, not caring for your feet well enough. Ah. And it is very common. In fact, 
we've evacuated people for foot injuries and or basically for um, guides sometimes get evacuated for something called tolio, which is very um, just kind of a, a very um, unpleasant like foot infection, basically a fungal infection. Um, and the guides have trouble keeping their feet healthy throughout the season. This is basically what trench foot was in the war that um, in World War One or in the Korean War when people oh, wow. get trench foot. It's the same thing, and they their feet are getting your feet are going to be getting wet and dry, wet and dry, and hot sand dries them out really quickly, and then wet and dry all day long. Um, and they're you know pretty much wet all day long when you're on the raft, and so it's easy for you to get infections. But it's also really easy to, um, you know, like, you know, step on a buried stick or something and have okay. a foot injury. And then that can really limit your um, enjoyment. So a couple of different, you know, good things to take, take care of your feet, maybe good tennis shoes to wear in camp, some good water shoes. Um, certainly plenty of sunscreen. And, um, you know, if you're going to be there in the middle of the summer, um, you know, sun clothes with with a... Um, SPF rating, they're amazing and they've come a long way. So now they have these, you know, hooded sun shirts and things that have SPF rating. Th those are all really good things to have. Um, good rain gear if you're going to be in the monsoon season. Yeah. And some warm clothes despite, you know, the the popular conception of how warm it is down there. It can be really cold during that time. Okay. Um, and then, you know, you're going to want good splash gear uh, in for those rapid days, because it can, you know, um, in the heat of the summer, you can probably go just, you know, uh, without good splash gear and just kind of minimize how much uh, clothing you're wearing underneath and let your skin just dry quickly. But it can get pretty cold on some of those rapid days. And so mm -hmm. it might be nice to have like a splash top. Okay, good to know. Very yeah. great to know. And then uh, finally, any just uh, top tips that you would recommend for those who want to come raft, raft the canyon? Maybe just a little extra tip to, to help them out that they may not find. Sure. Well, I would say figure out whether or not you're going to be able to find some boatmen or yeah. boat women who uh -huh. you know. And if you are or you know some, start the conversation about whether they're interested in doing a private trip and see if you have enough people to um, pilot the boats and then jump on the lottery and make a plan and and, and go for it and um, and then when you lock that down contact one of those flagstaff companies and um, just rent all the gear I mean 60 bucks a day yeah it's one of the cheapest vacations I've been on a long time cheap so and if not if you don't have that community of um, of boat people around you and you can find them and kind of get, um, you know, get acquainted with some of them in your community um, by doing one of the rafting trips or joining some of the kayak clubs or whatever it is. Um, but if you don't have that, which not everybody does and not everybody has that experience or that group of friends, or maybe you don't even have that community in your in your your little town that you live in or your city, um, then you can just take a commercial trip. And then I would just decide uh, what you know, um, your constraints are, do you have children that you want to take on there, um, that are less than 12, then maybe you can do that lower three day stretch. Um, how much time do you have? Do you want to go with a, um, motor company or would you prefer not to hear the motor? Um, the motor's pretty inconspicuous when you're, when you're motoring down, it kind of stays in the back and pool, the sound pools up there. But it still is a motor, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we spend time with it off floating. But, you know, really the best way to see it is probably just to have the silent hiss of the oars in the water, you know. So if you can afford to do one of those and, um, you know, spend six or seven or eight days doing that or even 12 doing a full one, consider all those things. But more than anything, I would say just go do it at some point in your life because it really is the best river trip out there. That is very well said. Truly, thank you for coming on the show today. It's truly been a pleasure. Uh, we're going to do a, a full write-up on experiencesyoushouldhave.com, um, so definitely check that out. Uh, thank you, Andy. 
Thanks so much, Gail. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, anytime. And remember to please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell your boss, tell anyone that you might talk to about experiences that you should have podcasts. And if you are listening on an uh, iPhone and you're using Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review if you love this podcast. So truly, thank you for listening. And until next time, for a new adventure.